I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fangs, claws coming out through, three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. So, congratulations are in order, Brandon. We're back, baby. Why, well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we are back. We are back. And baby is definitely uh, relevant to that. <laughs> I got a whole, whole, whole ass baby. Got a whole baby. A whole person. There's, if anyone's wondering, part of why we're, uh, uh, what our, our break was for, if you're not part of the, the Discord or don't follow us on the social, socials or what have you, I don't have a baby. And it took a little uh, uh, baby break on account of uh, the baby. Very good baby. Mm-hmm. I'd say top five babies of all time. Um, yeah. Who's, okay, wait a second, Brandon. Wait a second. Am I going to have to talk to Erica about this? Who is a better <laughs> baby than your baby? Well, my baby hasn't I there has there has it been around long enough to gain some 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 achievements. Okay, okay, okay. This specific she hasn't really achieved anything. I mean, day 2 she could hold her head up on her own. She was like that bobble heady, but she was good. Yeah. Day 2, head up all on her own. And uh by week 6 she learned she had hands. So she's she's doing good. She um <laughs> Doing good. She poops up her snatch a lot, so we got to uh, clean that out a lot. Um, oh, that's a fun thing you just said. Yeah, it was a fun <laughs> yeah. There's, and I learned something that I, this is going to be more of a, a, a confession. Um, okay. I learned that women are born with their, uh, their, their, uh, all their, their clitoris. They're born with it. I thought they grew it at puberty. Like their boobs. I was 30 when I learned that. What, Brandon? I thought women grew their, um, their, what, what's, what's the, a nice, there's no one, cl- clitoris. I thought they, I thought they grew them at puberty. You're basically puberty. saying I thought they grew their vaginas. I hope you No, I thought, no, I always thought they had that. I just thought that came in at the same time as like, you know, you get puberty, like you start getting armpit hair. If you're a lady, you know, you might start growing some, some, some breasts. I thought yeah, that was I... all happened at the same time. Puberty is secondary sexual sexual uh, attributes, not primary. Would have been great if I knew that. <laughs> I went to go go uh, uh, clean some 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 mess that was made, and I was like, some white ass poopies. It's some some, and I was like, huh, look at that. <laughs> That's already there, isn't it? <laughs> oh God, I I feel if your daughter ever listens to this episode she will be mortified congratulations pico or not or not maybe <laughs> you know what she might not be because she's being raised in part by, by me she would be like of course that's definitely course. some dad stuff that's ex- explicitly oh. what he would say yeah huh. um so i have i have a story continue it's not it's not as impressive as uh bringing a new child a new life into the world but but I will say this. It's a very good. uh, It is very good evidence for why you should never allow me to watch a child by myself. Oh, no. Okay. So um, this Friday. Yes. So for those of you wondering, this is like um, December 10th of 2021 that this happened. So this this Friday, I am. on Fridays, I go to pick up my uh, girlfriend, Christina, um, to spend the weekend, most weekends. Um, and uh, so also on Fridays is my trash pickup day, right? Yes. Okay. So I had taken the pa- the, tra- the trash out. It had been taken. It had been put back into place in front of my driveway. And I'm like, I'm getting my car. I put it into reverse. And my backup cam shows the... Uh, the um the trash can right so i'm like oh damn it i gotta get out and do that so i get out of the car i go and i grab uh my trash can right yes so um 
I'm bringing it back, and then something strange happens, Brandon. What do you think happened? Was your car not in park? Was your car in neutral? My car was in reverse. Your car was in reverse? Oh, no. Yes. (laughs) So here's the weird thing about that. Um, I was able to go to the end of my driveway, grab the, the, the garbage can, and bring it almost entirely to the front of my house before my car started moving. That's crazy. That's impressive. I know your driveway, which, too. Which makes me think that my car might not have actually been in reverse, and it might have been in park, and it might have somehow jumped out of park into reverse. Oh, was the, the stick maybe not all the way... Does I have you, no idea. Do you have the wiggly I, I, thing where you got a yeah, wiggle stick? I, you got the wiggles. Yeah, oh. I I literally have no idea how, like, huh. I have done this a million times, Brandon. I have put my car in a park, gotten out, and done something. But, Brandon, so my car is now in reverse, going across the road. Oh, did now, it? luckily... It got all the way to the road? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So here's what happens, Brandon. I'm like... Fuck. And I have this this emotion that I've only had experience once before. And that was when I got into a car accident. <laughs> Where it's just like, is this really fucking happening to me? So I run around the car. The door's still open, thankfully. Right? Because for, wh- for whatever reason, I was like, I'm just going to leave the door open. And mm-hmm. like... It was a miracle that I left the door open because there would have been no way that I would have been able to. to there would have been no chance of me stopping it if that was the case. No, to work the um, Actually, it's a good thing because when the cars, it might just be when it's in drive, that they'll lock themselves. The the doors. Yeah. yeah. So Brandon, it gets worse though. <laughs> so I get around. I get to the door. I get to the entrance to the car. I'm about to, like, get in and press the, like, I tried to, I was trying to press the brake. Yeah. Like, before anything else, I was trying to either position my foot or my hand to press the brake. Yes. I trip. (laughs) I trip, Brandon. Oh, God. I trip and fall, and the car keeps going. I somehow (laughs) manage not to get run over by my car. Okay? So the car continues to go in reverse. It hits the curb, and we I hear this, and I'm like, oh, fuck, there's a tree right there. I need to deal with this. <laughs> so pure adrenaline, I run. I get back to it. Um, I hit the, I was able to hit the stick, yeah. and it goes into neutral. Okay. Which is great, which is great, except for the fact that it continues rolling forward. Yeah. Now it's rolling towards my house. <laughs> so, I tr- so I try to get into the car again. Okay. Uh, this is the third try to, for me to tell this story on recording. Um, so uh, wherever it cut off, I think it was on me talking about the car going forward after I hit it into neutral. Yes. Um, Because it kept going forward exactly towards my house, which is... Uh, for those of you who don't own a home, a nightmare, the idea of your car running into your home, uh, in general, that's just, that's not what you want to have happen. Um, just, just, you might not own a home, but like, let me just let you know, that's a bad thing. So (laughs) most people, most of the time you don't want your car to hit most things. Most things, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I I am now running so like I didn't I wasn't able to get into the car at that point and I was running forward um and I, I tried to get in you again running like the android from Godzilla Is that fair? I wish I wish uh it was more like um it was more like David from Shit's Creek I'd probably oh, assume good. <laughs> good. Like I I'm I'm just going to guess that was actually what it looked like because I can't run <laughs> um not anymore i used to be able to run back when i was in high school and like a functioning human yeah the um, last but, time like, i ran on purpose would have been high school yeah yeah uh so brandon yes wouldn't you know it i fell again <laughs> this is my 
I'm keeping in mind that this is all you trying to go pick up your girlfriend. Meaning yes. this is yes. written as if like perfect rom com writing. Oh, perfect 100%. writing. A hundred percent. Um, it, it's one of those things you wouldn't believe if it happened in a movie. You'd be like, yeah. no one's that stupid. It's like, actually, this happens when I watch um, horror movies. I'm like, nobody trips that many times when they're but running. But I did. But apparently but they I do. I did. They do. They do. And I am evidence of the fact that they do. <laughs> uh, so luckily at this point, somebody saw me fall the first time and had been running towards my car the whole time <laughs> and they scream get uh, get out of the way i get out of the way they're able to stop it and holy shit somehow nothing goes wrong nothing's broken no- nothing's like torn up nothing's shattered um on the car right <laughs> uh i did have to fill the tires up after that cuz apparently the bounce was great enough that the tires deflated a little bit. <laughs> um, but Brandon, now, uh, after that, the, the, the coda to this story is uh, the next day, I was in severe pain. <laughs> <laughs> For multiple reasons. One, I ran. That's, that's key. <laughs> key. I, I ran. So my body was like, what the fuck are you thinking, you idiot? Body's like, what is this? We're not, we're not built for this. We are not built to run. Uh, and second, because I fell three times, <laughs> I've had a stiff neck since then and a massive knot in my shoulder that hurts to touch. <laughs> so I'm dying. Um, and uh, the, the real important reason, the reason I was telling this story in the first place, Brandon, and I mentioned this to you already, I'm going to say it again. This is why I should never be allowed to watch your kid or any other kid. Because clearly, I can't even take care of my own body. <laughs> so, I, putting a child in my hands is just gross negligence. There's, I wouldn't let you right now anyway, because I, I suspect she's plotting with the cats some nefarious thing. I'm not well, sure what it is yet. They're not talking. Obviously. But, uh, well, yeah. well, she wants more than just the Maserati. She wants more than the Maserati. She, Did that she wants wa- a Beamer, too. She wants a... Yeah, oh, we could get her a little fleet of uh, the little cars for kids. <laughs> I, did <laughs> we talk f- about that before? We, I don't remember. We talked about it on the previous recording, but... Um, that, I don't we, know we if that made it. On, but, no, uh, we talked about it on the Lost recording. That's why I was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, this bougie little baby can't even walk yet, or she can't even crawl yet. She's got a little Maserati, a little tiny yeah. baby Maserati, a baby Roddy, a baby. Oh, oh, I could put little neon lights under it. I could trick out this little car. You could, and I totally believe that you would. There, yeah, I am not above it. <laughs> I will definitely do that. It's oh. not even that you're not above it, Brandon. It is. It would be almost out of character for you to not do. That. Oh, yeah, give it a little custom paint job, put some little yeah. lights under it. Yeah, yeah. Pop it open and see if uh, I can't remove anything that's limiting the voltage going to the motors and really let that thing rip. <laughs> I think your wife might have some problems with that. <laughs> Possibly. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. She might be on board with it. But my guess, my guess, no. It's where I live is relatively safe to do that. It's not on a main road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's fair. Actually, no, uh, I could do that and then go over to um, uh, where that, that field is near my house. And there's a park. So I, there's there's a couple open spots where, where you could, yeah, you there's, could really there's a open few it places, up. Yeah, there's a few places that you could really open up a, a child Maserati. <laughs> there's, there, actually, I don't want to give it. You can take it to the old IBM plot, IBM site. We could. Someone just bought that, and I don't want to give out the exact location of where I live, but there's a non-zero chance I could take her to a spot, and she could drive her baby Maserati into an armored vehicle. That is a possibility. <laughs> that is, that a, is a distinct possibility. <laughs> that is a thing that could happen. That is a thing that could oh, happen. Or you yeah. could turn the Maserati into an armored vehicle. I could cover it in little like pots and pans, and do her <laughs> up. Like, 
<laughs> make like a, like a baby version of that guy that welded uh, steel all over a forklift or whatever. <laughs> uh, well, there was the guy who made a tank literally yeah. impenetrable. Yeah. Uh, and his excuse for why he kept doing it was nobody stopped me. So yeah. why would I stop? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he oh. made it out of that alive, though. So no. That's a whole other thing. Which, it's entirely possible he could have. It was, he he stopped himself. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty it, much. Is what happened there. But yeah, mm-hmm. they just couldn't stop him. <laughs> that's, that's the real lesson, everyone. Like, the trick to doing anything is just welding enough pieces of, like, steel over it that bullets can't penetrate. Yeah, which is a thing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, the last thing, and I won't go too far into it, is um, I got very much into sumo, and I'm in a fantasy sumo league, and it's great, and I'm better than all of you now. So, Brandon, uh, I I have one question. So this was something I was going to ask just yes. before I realized that the recording stopped. Uh-huh. Um, what does a fantasy sumo league look like? Like, how do you how do you earn points? Because like I know in in oh. like fantasy football, it's like individual players on your it's, team it's as they do similar things similar to fantasy football so in okay. the in the main um like pro sumo uh uh, uh tournaments there's a yeah. there's about 50ish people so what you okay. do is you build a um a heya or a stable basically so you, okay. out of those 50 people you choose um we didn't cover the rules yet um the the it gets announced on the twenty fourth what the lineup's gonna be so you, you wait till the lineup um, okay and you basically take turns picking who you want and every time they get a win you earn a point okay okay so it's it's basically the it's more or less the same concept just a little bit different it's basically the same concept and the okay. thing that makes it very interesting is that sumo tournaments are fifteen days long and they happen mm-hmm. every sixty days. And it's more really? of one very long tournament. And there's no off season. So basically what would happen is if you crack a rib, yeah, uh, th- it doesn't stop. So you either play with a broken rib or every match you miss to heal counts as a loss. Oh, no. So it's just a brutal, like, it is brutal. That's, that's a, like, intense sport. It's very intense and also, it's all one long thing, so you'll lose a rank for missing games because of a broken rib or like oh a, my God. or like a knee injury. And here's the thing: only the top um, professional positions are paid, so people oh, no. go hard because it's entirely possible that you can like tear a ligament, have to heal, and therefore you'll lose your salary for the like the next quarter. Oh because no! Of it. So people go hard. Oh, God, that's horrifying. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And the other, like, baller shit about sumo is you get paid in stacks of cash on the spot after each win. So you will just, like, throw a dude out of a ring, and then a man walks up with wads of cash and hands them to you, and then you walk (laughs) off stage. It is amazing. That doesn't sound sketchy in the slightest. It is amazing. (laughs) That's pretty great. That's pretty fucking good. Um... Sumo wrestlers are big dudes. That's yeah. only the top ranking positions. If you look at all the lower ranking um, Rikishi in, uh, in that, mm-hmm. th- it's it's just that you basically do nothing but martial training and strength training for like ten years, and mm-hmm. then you then you start putting on body weight as like a tool to make you harder to push out. So it's just pure muscle, and then the 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 heaviness is just to make you harder to move god it is insane oh no i would never i would never survive going up against a sumo wrestler i would like i would literally dissolve it's every the impact went off the first um uh the, the first collision is the it's a Literally the same force as a car accident. So Yeah, I'm not surprised. You basically get in a car accident 15 times in a row, and then a big dude slaps you in the face. <laughs> and that's the tournament. It's amazing. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. But uh, without further ado, Brandon, let's get back to what this podcast is about, other Woo! than me talking about horrors in my own life. I missed um, it. 
Yeah, no, we haven't talked in a while about... We actually haven't had a chance to, like, have a voice call in a while either. No. Um, just because of stuff. So, Brandon... <laughs> stuff is baby. Stuff is baby. Stuff also, is baby. I had a lot of shit that I was dealing with in terms of, like, less... It's less difficult than a child, but I needed personal... I need to play a lot of Halo to deal with uh, my to reality. Decompress um, from trying to become Dr. John. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, uh, this is Cryptopedia, for those of you who are unaware, and actually there might be some people who are new on this episode, which is, is a weird episode to start on, but hey, you be you. Enjoy yeah. this. Um, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And this week, Brandon, um, I'm taking a suggestion from one of our newest uh, patrons, okay. uh, Bushcraft Kelso. He, oh, yeah. Um, Thank you, Bushcraft Kelso. And sorry you decided to become a patron the moment we took a little break. It, it was actually really funny because it was literally the week that we, like, took our break. Like, started to br- take a break. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I, I saw it. I'm like, oh, my God. I feel I feel so terrible because yeah. it, was, it would, couldn't have been more, like, perfectly timed, to be totally honest. Um, but this week, Brandon, I want to talk about the boogeyman, the boogeyman, so, the boogeyman, um, which actually is a little bit different than what I thought it was going to be. So I started researching it and I'm like, oh, this is going to be different. Mm-hmm. Um, so Brandon, you and I both know that humans have this innate fear of the unknown, like the other, yes. right? Um, we've talked about, I think we've talked about on this podcast about HP Lovecraft's fear of the other and like. Yeah. Things along those lines. And, like, how it's it's kind of a thing that's endemic to humanity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and whether it's carried through genetics or is learned behavior, it's one of the most powerful sensations that a person can feel. Yeah. Fear. It's visceral. It's base. It triggers something in our lizard brains, right? And at the core of the many of the stories we tell on this podcast, fear is actually the driving force, right? Whether it be fear of an unknown phenomena, fear of other people, or in some cases, a fear of obscurity. Yet, we've never really con- covered the concept of fear directly on this show. Okay. And this week, we're going to change that a little bit. Um, and I'm going to start exploring the Boogeyman and some of its like literally uncountable number of permutations. But Brandon, before we get into that, what was your Boogeyman? Did you have oh, a Boogeyman as a specific child? specific Boogeyman as a child? Yeah. Hell yeah, yeah. There was, well, I don't know if it was... Is being afraid of, like, having your feet hang off the end of the bed because something's going to grab them a, uh, well, a boogeyman? Well, was, was that a fear that was instilled in you by a parent or somebody in a higher position? Like, someone in no. a position of power over you? No, that was just it, a naturally okay. occurring thing. Fair enough. The, a fear that was instilled for me was from an episode of Rugrats where they ate a watermelon seed and then uh, it started growing in them. So I was afraid to eat seeds for a long time. That's pretty fair. Um, my my uh, my personal boogeyman uh, was maggots. Maggots. That's a fun as one. As a concept. Maggots as a concept. Because one day I was outside with my dad um, and I think I was playing Pokemon because yeah. that's what I do. Um I've been playing Pokemon for a very long time. Uh, I was playing Pokemon, and there was a trash can, and I touched the trash can, and my dad, like, he didn't yell at me, but he was like, don't touch the trash can. And I'm like, why? And he's like, because there's maggots. And I'm like, what is a maggot? And he's like, it becomes a fly, and, like, if you touch it, it can get into your skin. And I'm like, It can get into your skin? That's not true, is it? That's how no. It, well, they okay. only eat they eat dead skin. So um, yeah. it was it was basically him telling me not to touch the trash, right? Yeah, right. Uh, Brandon, you know what that what that ha- what happened because of that? Just a fear that if you touched a magnet, it would burrow into your body. Uh, a nearly decade long fear of me touching trash cans. Oh no. I, I re- like, there was a part, for a part of my life, I never touched a trash can with my hand. That's crazy. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was something. So, uh, just remember that, everyone. If you're trying to, to dissuade your child from something, uh, 
they remember. Oh yeah. <laughs> they remember. There's a uh, it's you got to be careful what you say on kids cuz uh turns out little things all oh, lifetime long uh uh <laughs> there's a lot yeah. of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah, that's, of that's dinosaurs for a long time because I watched Jurassic Park way too early. Fair, that's fair. Like I would um, always sleep with my covers over my head because I was afraid a dinosaur would walk past my bedroom window and see me inside and be like, "Oh, that's probably delicious." <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Well, they'd they'd go for they'd go for the humans in the tin cans outside before that. The human. Oh, You're, the- yeah, you're on a you're on a you lived on a relatively busy road, so like yeah, they would have gone for that. They would have gone for those before you. Were dinosaurs faster than cars? Um, they don't have to be faster than cars. They just have to run out and hit a car from the side. True, or just block the road because cars aren't made to go on not roads. Yeah, like a a, a T Rex could take on a, a car. I don't remember how fast they could run, but I, I think a T Rex would win against a car. Ultimately, in the yeah. end, Fair. Um, I won't, I won't yeah. dispute that. But we're not going to get into to dinosaurs because this is not a John gets angry episode. Well, it kind of is, but we'll get into that. Every episode's <laughs> a John gets angry episode if we try hard enough. That's fair. Um, so the boogeyman is really one of the most nebulous concepts we've ever covered on the show, because unlike Sasquatch or Nessie, there's not a generally accepted archetype for the boogeyman on the global scale, but it like sort of exists everywhere. Right. Yeah. Um, so like broadly speaking, the boogeyman is more or less an umbrella myth, right? Like it's a, it's a, bucket. it's like, it, it, it's like a, um, it's like a kingdom or a phylum of yeah. cryptid, right. Or monster is the boogeyman. It, it has sub, categorizations of boogeyman under it and like monster um like many many people have heard the term like heard the proverbial don't do don't be bad or else blank will get you right yeah uh in the course of their lives like that's that honestly to me is how you can codify a boogeyman right and that's the the general definition i'm going to be using going forward for boogeyman is Something that is a cautionary tale that personifies that fear in some way. Okay? Yeah. Oh. Um, oh, never mind. I, I just thought of how I could fuck with my kid for a while. Like, I could always be like, don't do that, or Danny DeVito's going to get you, but she won't know what Danny DeVito is. She'll just know that it's a thing that comes and gets you if you are bad. And then just, like, re- like make a kid that's just terrified of Danny DeVito for no kind reason. Of, that kind of be fucking hilarious. Yeah. Then this podcast would be unlistenable. To your child. <laughs> so yeah. if you don't want your kid to ever listen to this podcast, do that because it's it would literally be unlistenable. Um, so in this regard, a boogeyman can be considered like an instructive force for children. Um, for example, while the concept of death by drowning might be inscrutable to a child, a fearsome entity that is rooted in something that can, can they conceptualize like taking your family away taking you away from your family um can be more impactful right so like one of the keys of boogeyman and like certain cultures boogeyman will outright kill people right oh yeah but like a lot of boogeymen in america at least don't necessarily outright kill people right because the concept of death isn't as um prevalent in a lot of children's lives so it's more of like take you away or take something away from you or something along those lines. It's a yeah. punishment, right? There's something that you can understand, a kid can understand about being taken away from their family because obviously at some point they've been taken, they've had their family, a family member not near them, right? Yeah. Don't do so that or else Danny DeVito is going to nibble your toes. Continue. Well, that's horrifying. That That <laughs> I think might be the scariest one of the scariest boogeymen we're going to talk about today is Danny DeVito. Um, He's a get your toes. But yeah, it's basically a parenting hack. Um, yep. And uh, few, if any adults, typically take this entity seriously um, and subconsciously accept its purpose as like a, su- a pseudo-educational tool. Now, um, generally, the definition for a boogeyman 
uh, operates on the primary assumption that the boogeyman is an entity that inspires terror, particularly as a threat to children. More simply, it is the personification of terror. The bump of night, the dancing shadows in your periphery, essentially it's your imagination run wild. So in a sense, you're hanging your feet over the bed is a boogeyman. Because yeah. it is a personification of terror, right? Now, Brandon, what do you think a boogeyman looks like? Like, just, I'm curious what pops into your head when you think boogeyman. Uh, I've never actually personified, like, a boogeyman or, like, the monster under the bed. I've never actually, like, given form to them. So I guess, mm-hmm. it, for me, the boogeyman would be a formless void that gets you. I mean, that's scary, not gonna lie, that would terrify me. <laughs> um, yeah, I never actually put form to it. It's just the emptiness that is there is bad inside of it. You know what? That 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 actually tracks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna go over the ones that are like f- the form is defined, right? Because usually, Wait, did you did you have a, a spooky like a boogeyman or a monster in the closet that had form or an um, imaginary form? No, no. Okay. No, I don't think I did. This is a question I'm really uh, I'm really interested in asking people now is if they were afraid of a thing as a child under the bed in the closet what have you did they give it form or not? I I kind of had a thing but I'll talk about it later cuz it will it'll yeah. come up in The in other context. thing that I'm I'm going to that I'm going to start asking people is when they think is there a voice in their head? Because I just learned that people, there are people who exist that just think, but don't hear their own voice in their head when they think. Yeah, it, they just have thought. And like, it's super a thing. What? I've never heard of that before. It's like, what is this? There's also people who can't imagine something if they look like read a book, right? They can't imagine the scene. What? That's a thing. It, it's just people's brains work different. That's crazy. Yeah, it's it's the like it's the same like rough concept. I don't even know. I might even be related. I'm not sure. Um, but like, yeah, it's a thing. That's why some people really don't like books is because they can't imagine the scene. Yeah, that's right? bananas. Like they understand what's happening, but they they don't like have a conception of it. And I've heard about people having this this thing. Listen, Pika better be able to imagine things, other because she's got to get going to start her early on high fantasy. Early. Oh. Early. Oh, no. <laughs> that poor child. <laughs> like, for real, as soon as, like, she understands words, those are going to be her books. I'm going to get her high fantasy. Uh, I don't know what children, like, children, children books for high, but, like, we're going to put her slap her right in that Del Toro Quest lane. I mean, Del Toro Quest is a good book series. It is for, like, young kids. Yeah, I actually really, really enjoyed Del Toro Quest like a yeah. lot. That's fair. I'll I'll support that. I'll buy the books if I have to. There's I have a full set of Del Toro Quest upstairs. Do you have the tower ones? Do you have the ones after Del Toro Quest? Do you have the I, Shadowlands stuff? Do, I don't think I even read the Shadowlands. I think it went straight yeah. from Del Toro Quest. I think I read Del Toro Quest and then Ender's Game and then the wheel of time. I think that was my traject like my trajectory. Ender's game is good, but everything else Orson Scott card touch is a dumpster fire. Yeah, I didn't realize that um <laughs> Robert Jordan's wife was the editor for those for for tour books. So the guy yeah. that wrote Wheel of Time, his wife was the editor for both the Wheel of Time and Ender's game. Oh, wild. Yeah. Tour books put out some pretty good stuff. They put out a few bangers. Correct. Yeah. Um, but anywho, getting back to the, the actual physical description of the boogeyman, um, its precise taxonomy is incredibly variable. And as, as we've just mentioned, like it might not even have a form. But there are some commonalities that do actually appear in a number of boogeyman. This doesn't mean that they're necessarily linked in any way. It's just things that scare people, right? Yeah. Long nails, long claws, long teeth. Terrifying eyes, red, too large, generally off. You know, it's the things that, like, trigger that uncanny valley effect in people. Red glowing eyes. Something terrifying I read um, Mm -hmm. was that, 
the uncanny valley exists because at some point in our past um it was beneficial to us to be afraid of things that look human that aren't i yes but now, i also th- i i think there's a reason behind that beyond just being it would there be was a other like homo type looking people yeah. Is who yeah. it would have been, but my first thought before going like, "Oh yeah, there's like, w- is like the creepy like android from Alien type people out there," but and then it's like, "Oh mm-hmm. yeah, wait, there's a lot of us that just didn't make it." Yeah, and and then also you have to also consider the fact that like sickness, being able to identify sickness is a very key. Oh yeah. Trait. So like if somebody's off, like off being or, like, able pale, to pale, clammy looking. Yeah, being yeah. able to pick up that somebody's not doing all right. Yeah. is also, like, super beneficial, genetically speaking. So mm-hmm. Now, but Brandon, it is a creature of imagination. Humans define the features to fit the conditions it operates in. Does it take, take children away? You gotta give that fucker a bag. Can I hear you say unkind words? That, that, that bitch has got some ears. You know it. Is it known yeah. for scratching window panes? You're gonna need a set of claws on that sucker. Like all good stories... Boogeymen are frequently rooted in something in the imaginer's daily life. The boogeyman is a shapeshifter, formless until a form is required, as we've mentioned before on this very episode. Um, There is actually some academic interest in the origin of boogeyman as a word. Now, I found one potentially apocryphal account uh, that claims it's a bastardization of boogeyman, referring to the gaunt corpse tenders of the plague who drove buggies around and like carried bodies through the the, the thing so like they were more or less a harbinger of death in that, ca- yeah, that capacity yeah i don't know if i buy that explicitly I, I, but i would believe that the phrase itself not the boogeyman but the phrase itself would be generally english or your like anglo-european in origin mm-hmm. because they have bogans um and here bogies a lot, so that's not too far a leap to just throw a man at the end. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, well, it, it gets it, that. That's where I think it's more. This is that. That's actually more where I think it goes towards because there is also the word bogey, which is a Middle English term for hobgoblin, right? Yeah. Which yep. centers in a. It, it centers the boogeyman entity around this pre-existing concept of a monster that does things, um, but. That being said, there is no concrete first boogeyman or a definitive one in the way that Nessie is regarded as a specific type of animal or Sasquatch is regarded as a specific animal or any number of things, right? Like, any num- like there's so many other cryptids that are, like, defined, so to speak, that we've covered on this podcast. Yeah. Boogeyman is not one of them in any way, shape, or form. Now, what we do how- have, however, is a preponderance of entities that I like that from this... phrasing. Congratulations that that was good writing. That was I, well, good I, writing right there, Brandon. I have to write so much. You have do to have to write so much. So much. I have I noticed so that much. the the structure of your write ups has changed the more you've been writing. For... Yes, it yeah. super has. Yeah. It super has. Um, so there's a preponderance of entities that have emerged from this shapeless terror around the world. So. Brandon, let's take a trip around the world and visit some of these boogeyman real quick. All right. Before we visit new entities, I want to acknowledge this podcast has actually covered a number of creatures considered by some to be boogeymen. Now, keep in mind this is not a definitive list, and it's subject to interpretation. But in chronological order, here are the past boogeyman-adjacent episodes that we've covered, and there are a lot of them. Tata Duende, episode 15. The Bunny Man, episode 28. Black Eyed Kids, episode 47. Spring Heel Jack, episodes 48 and 50. The Puka, episode 59. The Jersey Devil, episode 68. Tambalosos, episode 73. And the Chupacabra, apparently, in episode 96. I found, like, a huh. list of it. Uh, this was, like, based off the listing on Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, so somebody considers these things to be boogeymen, right? Yes. Um, which, from my perspective, is all you really need for something to be considered a boogeyman is that somebody believes it's a boogeyman. Like, yeah. it's kind it's kind of the definition of the term. Yeah. Um, like, art, all you need for something to be art is for some people to believe that a thing is art. Pretty much, pretty much. It's it's the same rough concept. It's, it's, it's kind of like this... 
it's more or less like an ontological argument, um, I think, if I'm using that word correctly. Mm -hmm. I'll believe it. I mean, you're, you are the most qualified here to use that word correctly. Yeah, relating to the branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of being. Okay, I'm good. Okay. Whew. I thought I used the wrong one. Um, because there's another one. There's there's teleology as well, which I think is like the physical realm. But regardless, um now, Brandon, while it doesn't fit with this definition that I've set forth, I also think that the Eels episode qualifies as a boogeyman adjacent episode because they sure as fuck still inspire terror in me. Yeah, over they still a month later. For me too. Oh, that's another thing that I'm afraid of too. Um, and it's still, and it's falls into the same like no specific thing. It's just the void that has bad is bad. Oceans, big bodies of water. Oh, ter- yeah, terrified no. of them. I refuse to go on a cruise. Oh yeah, I will. I I don't care about flying. I'll stand on a cliffside. I'll do all sorts of shit like. A lot of things that scare people. I will yeah. do all of those things. But the point that I draw the line is a cruise. Yeah. You Never. cannot put me on a boat for that <laughs> long. Mm-mm. I don't trust boats. I don't trust cruise ships. A boat on the Hudson? Maybe. But then that's a whole nother Maybe. set of problems. Because, like, first of all, you have to be on the Hudson, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Problem one, the Hudson. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's honestly the scariest part of that. Uh, the fact that that is the water. Um, you know what's horrifying? I actually swam in the Hudson as a child. <laughs> I think everyone's come in contact with it. Do you remember that someone, she got put on blast water too. That one girl who was just dove into the Hudson off a boat or something on social media. And then people were like, why would you do that? That's terrible. But she did it in the worst part of the Hudson because she did it down near New York City. Oh, down like the city? Yeah, yeah, that's where it's real bad. It's real gross down there. Yeah, up here, all we have to worry about is them circuit board chemicals. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of feces. A lot of feces. Like a lot. Like a lot, lot. But yeah, circuit board chemicals too. Um, Now, so getting into the back to the boogeyman, Brandon. Um, beside regarding maggots as my personal boogeyman for a while, uh, I personally encountered one other boogeyman that's used in its intended context. It wasn't directed at me, but it was like a family boogeyman. Ever taste oh, a I maggot? Hate you. <laughs> God damn it. Your fucking illegal <laughs> chips. Maggot uh, chips. Maggot. What is it? Cheese maggot? It's Kasu Marzu maggot cheese flavor. Ah, uh, gross. These are Gross. the flavors the government doesn't want you to try, it says. It's perfect. for Probably for a reason. Like... Health. It's health reasons. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that there's there's a reason for that. Like, yeah. I mean, that's why Fugu's one of them, too. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> um, so this, this is, like, a family boogeyman. So, like, I don't know if other people have this, but there are, like, in my family, there is a specific boogeyman. That is called upon. That is used for the various children in my family. That is amazing. And it's not yeah. Danny D? It's not Danny D. Um, now, I want to say the boogeyman, as I said, was never directed at me. I was way mm-hmm. too good of a child, well-behaved of a child. Yes. Like, you, you were very... It, it. Well, here's the thing. Here's self-managed. The thing. You didn't need a boogeyman. You just had to reprimand me slightly and I would do the rest. It's, it's like, it's, I... It's, he doesn't need a boogeyman. His mental illness takes care of it for him. Pretty much. We'll just let pretty that much. shit run that, rampant. Uh, pretty much. It was, just, it was just my own self-deprecation. Like, yeah. you didn't need a boogeyman on top of it. It was already no. good enough. Oh, like, yeah. Now, um, my younger cousins, however were frequently the target of this particular terror. Um, in my recollection, the Ragman was a wandering her- hermit who had a bag filled with rags, hence the name. A if the kid was bag misbehaving... filled with rags. A bag filled with rags and, like, other assorted, like, detritus, right? Yeah. If a kid was misbehaving, the Ragman would show up 
and take the child away, never to be seen again. What he did was never specified. I want to say I've heard of the Ragman before, but it's it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. I th- not necessarily like a bag full of rags, but I think in the context of boogeyman, I've heard of a ragman. Yeah. So so it is actually it turns out a fairly I won't I won't say common, but it is a trend. Um like also the whole notion of ha- a boogeyman having a sack, super common. Super yeah. common. And we'll we're going to get into that. Don't worry. Don't worry. Um but like the the fact of the matter is it was a vague threat there was no specific punishment it was just the threat of separation right like yeah. it wasn't like you were going to get killed or anything along those lines you were just going to be taken away um which kind of gets back to the whole thing i was talking about before where it's like it's not necessarily death that's the punishment it's more generally like the punishment um, is that an unknown thing itself is going to happen to you. Yeah, or like something that you can relate to is going to happen. Yeah. Um that that's the key to a good boogeyman in my opinion. Um although I in all honesty, I don't think boogeyman is good parenting in the slightest using a boogeyman personally. I don't think it's a good idea. I think no. there's some seriously problematic issues that could come from using a boogeyman. But I'm also not a child. I don't. I have no intention of ever having a child of my own. So this is just me in my armchair. Um. So whatever. Now there's a ragman creepy pasta. I'm. I, I'm not surprised. Um. Maybe I'll read it for Creepypedia one of these days when oh, I ever do yeah. another Creepypedia. Um. So interestingly, Brandon, this story isn't just me weirdness, as we've already found out. Yeah. Um. Because I found a reference to it in a University of Southern California folklore archive. And I've reproduced the um, the story portion of this, this like, capture of this legend mm-hmm. here entirely. And it's it's a story told by a woman um, from, uh, like, like, the Midwest, right? So, when I was growing up, I was raised by a single mother and my grandmother, my mom's mom. Stepped in to help me when my mom was working, so I spent a lot of time with her. In her I house, love in her the neighborhood. Midwest need to define certain terms that everybody already knows, like it's grandmother. Pretty great. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. It's pretty. It's it's funny. Like actually, I do a lot of like the type of research I do is mostly interview driven because I'm more or less a computer science sociologist. Yeah. Um, because I'm basically studying the impacts of computing on people and what's the best way to do that ask yeah. people what they think um but that's like a super common thing when you interview people is they like will specify really simple concepts um but like <laughs> at it, it, no 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 critique i probably do it too when i talk to people it's just you don't notice it until it's like written out because as a matter of speech it it's something that you don't necessarily notice it's it's super interesting. It's super interesting. Um, but anywho, so uh, I spent a lot of time in her house in her neighborhood, and she was much older for her grandma. She was born in 1911, and she didn't have my mom until she was almost 40. So she came up from another generation and mostly spoke German at home when she grew up on a farm in Arkansas. I don't know if this is where the story comes from, but... She was a great grandmother, and I would never use would never use violence or anything to keep us in line. But if we were misbehaving, the most ominous threat was that if we didn't get back in line and start doing what we were supposed to do, that the next time the ragman came by, she would leave us out and tell him he could take us away. So my sister and I were terrified that there was this there was also this man that w- wandered around the neighborhood occasionally at twilight. And I think he was probably, if not homeless, then verging on something of that. But it was back in the day when I don't think I'd ever seen a homeless person in my small town. So he was always pushing some small cart. And I think when she was first living in that home, there was a man who came by to take pots and pans and whatever little knickknacks that were broken. So he was known as the rag man. And he'd take trash or whatever, whatever and take it away. So that's really it. 
is that I think my sister's and I's mind, we associated it with the specific man, but it was really this nebulous threat of the ragman. That was going to come, and we were going to be taken out with the trash if we didn't get back in line. <laughs> and we did not want to be taken away by the ragman, so we got back on the straight and narrow. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so um, the Ragman story is basically uh, more or less you're we're gonna throw our child out in the gar. <laughs> Behavior, I'm gonna put you in the garbage. Pretty much, oh. it's pretty much the story is behave or I'm gonna have the garbage man take you away. Yeah. Um, and now, interestingly, as I said before, this particular telling comes from the Midwest, but the general story and the general themes match. Coincidentally, I think that this tale also originated from my grandmother as well, who was close to from the same generation. She was a little bit later. Yeah. And while the UCS researcher believes that this is an extension of Germanic origin, I don't think that's the case. Um, And that's mainly because my grandmother was not a German grandmother. She was more or like, I know, I know people will say like, oh, I'm American, um, but my grandmother didn't really have a t- close allegiance with anything other than maybe Irish yeah. heritage, right? Like, um, that was the most cultural, like, affiliation she had was with Ireland, right? So mm-hmm. not German, to say the least. To me, I think that this is related to the Great Depression, um, because my grandmother, uh, grew up during the Great Depression, Right. So um, the boogeyman in this particular case is born from the scavenger mindset of the Depression. And that was something that was actually a part of my grandmother's everyday life. Like the amount of stuff that my grandmother would collect, she was without a doubt a hoarder. And it was almost guaranteed because of the Great Depression. Did she do the thing where like they're very careful with wrapping paper because they want to save the wrapping paper? For like around like Christmas times, possibly. Christmas presents? Yeah, I don't I don't remember specifically that particular thing, but she saved a lot of stuff. Yeah, like it was a lot of things that if if it if it was able to be trash if it was trashable, she'd usually like trash it nice. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, trash it nice. Right? Did she like, have say like just grab fistfuls of straws from McDonald's? She had a lot of stuff from various places, for sure. <laughs> that is all. That's all I can recall. But yeah, she was she was incredibly frugal, and like yeah. I think that's a I think that's endemic to that generation because that sense of frugality was necessary, right? Yeah. Because you lived in a time when you basically were struggling to survive, and anything could help. So, mm-hmm. to me. This boogeyman is born from like more or less real life experience, and like it's an experiential boogeyman um, that caused fear in the individuals who tell the story for a different reason, right? Because mm-hmm. it represented a dark time in their life. Now, I want to also point out the ragman is an actual thing that existed in communities in the flesh and blood, so. The real Ragman was known as the Rag and Bone Man. And in an, it was an individual who was in extreme poverty, who would roam the streets scavenging for materials. These individuals would have sacks or carts, which they carried with them as they searched for anything of value to salvage. So basically, they're salvage people, right? Yeah. To some children, they were objects of fascination as they watched them work. Sometimes, however, they would taunt them, which resulted in at least one case, the ragman telling the parents of the child, which resulted in real consequences for bad behavior. That sounds amazing. Also, was, that, that, those are just whole, we, I've got some of those. In the, yeah. in the near, they're just almost, they, they wander around four, four or five o'clock in the morning, go through recycling and then leave. They don't, yeah, they don't bother anybody. I think, I think the key, though, is like in this particular case, it's like a very specific, like... I don't want to say thing, but like it's a very specific classifier, and like that's the way that they called them, right? Yeah. Um, so, I actually have a quote about that story where the person got told on by the ragman. Nice. Um, the first time I was ever punished was because of the ragman. 
He went down to Laurel Street yelling rags. I hit behind a bush and yelled rags back at him. He went and told my grandmother. I spent a week inside for punishment. It was 1960 and I was five years old. Seems like it was yesterday. Yeah, because you harassed a homeless person. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty the much. Were like, just leave him alone. <laughs> Stop. Don't. Yeah. Don't just do stop. that. Don't. <laughs> Go get the Nono can. Yeah, it's basically, that's basically it. But in other cases, they would already be a source of fear, and parents would weaponize them in precisely the manner as described in the story. Now, Brandon. Brandon. Yes. There also exists another boogeyman known as the Sax Man, who is basically an identical character to the Ragman, although I think he's in, from Spanish-speaking countries. Now, I told to tell the Ragman version of the story because I have a personal anecdote linking to it. Now, that being said, the dramatic portions of this are very important. Mm -hmm. um, because the story does remember a few well-known boogeymen and one not so well-known, but we're going to talk about it. Um, it's got the well-known Krampus. Echoes, because, you know, Krampus, Krampus has... Krampus, Krampus has the... He's got the basket, right? That he throws the children in. Krampus has a few things. <laughs> he's got a few things. He's got a few things. And we're going to... This is this this probably is going to be a... Uh, there will probably be another Krampus episode sometime down the line. But this is like a, a thousand foot view of Krampus here. Yeah. Um, because I wanted to talk about Krampus because we're talking about boogeymen. And Krampus is a pretty good boogeyman. Yeah. Um... And now there's also the lesser known Zwart Pete, or uh, also known as Black Pete. Brandon, have you ever heard of Zwart Pete? I am very familiar with Black Pete. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good, good, good. So yep. we're gonna we're gonna get into that in a bit. But uh, yeah, we we both we're both them, aware uh, of what Black Pete is. <laughs> yeah, them uh, them Danish folks sure have some traditions. Dutch. Dutch, Dutch. Sorry, Dutch. Yeah, we're gonna get into that in a second. Um. And actually, Brandon, there's, like, a lot of boogeyman surrounding Christmas. Like, oh, yeah. A lot, like, an obscene number of boogeyman, right? I just chose these two because, one, one's super popular, and, two, one is horrifying. Um, mm. But arguably, I'd say Santa Claus himself is a boogeyman. Yeah. Um, But I'm not going to litigate that because I'd rather take a trip to the Alps. So, a demon... Standing on two hooves with horns curling out of its head, Krampus is a proper boogeyman of Austria and its surrounding regions. In addition to its goat-like appearance, Krampus is renowned for his long tongue and a basket on his back for carrying naughty children. Additionally, he sometimes carries chains that symbolize the binding of the devil, another boogeyman if we're going to be completely honest, by the Christian church. Frequently rattled for dramatic effect because... Christmas, if it, if not anything, is drama, right? Nothing but. Nothing but drama, like, without a doubt. Um, so, it's believed that Krampus has pagan origins and was repurposed by the church because you're not going to stop, if you're not going to stop a holiday, you might as well join it. Like, let's be real. Because, like, the fact of the matter is you're never going to be able to stop someone from doing a holiday, right? Yeah. The best you can do is, like, redirect that holiday towards what you want it to be. Um, once a holiday's there, it's there. You're, you don't get rid of it. People don't like to give up holidays, which we'll actually get into in a second, too. Um, can be problematic sometimes, to say the least. Um, <laughs> so, in practice, Krampus is the bad cop to St. Nicholas's good cop, right? Yeah. He more or less rides shotgun in the Alpine regions. As St. Nicholas rewards the good children... Krampus punishes the naughty. The extent to the of the punishment, however, I want to say, say he. I want to say he does he gut you. I want to say he guts guts you. No, it's it that is. I not might be usually... thinking of a different. I might be thinking of a different holiday theme. You might be. You might be thinking of a different. A different Christmas boogeyman because, like I said, there are so many of them. There's a lot of them. I literally just chose these two because I wanted to pick. Because I was like, oh, it's Christmas. I could do two. I can do a Christmas boogeyman. Um, and then I remembered Swart Pete, and then things started to spiral. Um, <laughs> so, 
As St. Nicholas rewards the good children, Krampus, as I said before, punishes the naughty. The extent of his punishment, however, is completely variant upon the telling, which this... this So it might actually be that you've heard that about Krampus, yeah. right? Because Krampus, like, once again, like, these are myths. These are, like, the story will fit to match whatever circumstances will be most effective on the child, mm-hmm. right? Um... In some cases, he'll brandish a birch rod to slap the children. Um, and the birch rod has some paganistic origins. Like, there's a reason for the birch rod um, in the original pagan rituals that this is derived from, most likely. Um, and then in other cases, his weapon of choice is a whip, right? Hell yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And, Brandon, he's also not beyond absconding with, quote-unquote, evil children. Um, he puts them in his basket or sack, depending on who you're talking to, and takes them to a number of secondary locations, which, as we all know... Never go to a secondary location. That's a fact. Never Um, go to a secondary location. (laughs) That's the key. Do not let Krampus take you to a secondary location. No. Never let Krampus take you to a secondary location. Say, we're going to stay here and go around back and I'll make it quick. Anyway, especially <laughs> especially people dressed as Krampus. If they are willing to dress as Krampus, never allow them to take you to a secondary location. Oh, just never follow a Krampus furry. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's a yeah. Kramp- Krampus cosplayers are nightmares, and we actually do talk about them a little bit. Oh, do we? Um, yeah, it's a little. There's a little section in here. Oh, good. Um, so these locations frequently result in the death of the child, whether that be drowning, eating. Or even them driving, dragging them straight to hell. Good. Um, interestingly, while he's evil in the sense that he's a literal demon, Krampus is actually, like, to me, reads as an upholder of lawful order, like a just yeah. character, right? Like, that's the, the most interesting thing to me, because, like, he's punishing the wicked, right? But he's evil, but he's punishing the wicked. So, like... It's kind of like this weird. This is a, this is a thing that happens a lot in Judeo Christian myths, where the person who's the like punisher tends to be like also like they're evil as well for some reason, which really, yeah. you know, I mean, it kind of gets it kind of gets to the whole notion of like crime and punishment and penitence and mm-hmm. like how maybe there might be some problems with the system that we have. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Per- perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. Perhaps. Um, he, he, his behavior harms those who do bad punitively explicitly, right? So he, yeah. he explicitly deals out punitive damage to people who have done bad, right? His retribution is meted out in an act that many people can conceptualize through the act of sta- spanking. And then once again, the stealing him thing, same concept as the Ragman, right? Yeah. Now, while I'm sure other members of the Boogeyman Club have some celebrations, Krampus is buck wild, right? So it typically takes place on December 6th, St. Nicholas Day. Mm-hmm. Krampus Knocked, literally Krampus's Night. Yeah. Uh, is Krampus a particular knocked. type of parade. Yeah, it's fucking insane. Great. There's a lot of great concerts. On uh, Krampus it's, Knocks. It's insane. Uh, Local band Freak- Shadow Witch, shout out. They do a lot of Krampus-related uh, stuff. Uh, do they? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, like upstate New York and Halloween, um, it's a parade staffed by a gang of local young, fo- uh, local young folks as Krampus. Because I, I don't know if you remember this, Brandon, but um, Halloween around here is entirely stabbed by teenagers who take it way too seriously. Yeah. Entirely. That's why Halloween's great. Yeah, it's also, like, kind of horrifying when you think about it. What, Halloween? Well, I mean, the fact that, that, uh, that, like, haunted houses are completely stabbed by, like... Oh, uh, that's true, that they are stabbed... Yeah, give, by teenagers. Give the teenager a chainsaw. I I see where the problem. Yeah, might be. yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's a little bit of a problem, like slightly. Um, they actually yeah. made a joke about that on SNL, and uh, like they did a they did a hall a fall, 
parody of the Hudson Valley, basically. Oh, dude. and it was like I was watching it when I watched it. I'm like, God damn it, this is so accurate. It hurts my soul. That's here. Yeah, you, <sighs> we probably shouldn't stab the haunted houses with people who are the same age would have thought it'd be funny if happens in their head and then yeah, and yeah. then the, they follow through i mean i even ra- i was even in a haunted house once which is you know it kind of goes to show you uh all teenagers revel in the fact that they can scare a human yeah it's great it's, it's kind of just a fact of life yeah um so in particular, these young folks are clad in goat or sheepskin suits, wear horns or masks, um, which sometimes are wood and sometimes are latex. And they're frequently wielding whipping instruments as they storm the city. Many will whip the legs of children, <laughs> while others will outright steal hats from people and hand out Krampus schnapps. To the adults, <laughs> which apparently Krampus is a thing schnapps. that I found out about. Krampus shots. That's a thing. Um, schnapps, rather. That's great. That's, they just wander the streets with whips and booze. Pretty much. It's. Uh, it sounds like a time. It sounds like a distinctly German thing. It sounds distinctly German, and it s- sounds like there's a lot of sex that smells bad happening. Oh, there's definitely some <laughs> bad selling, smelling sex that happens. Like, yeah. there's zero doubt that that happens. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, not God. in the parade grounds, but like off in a corner in an alley, probably. Yeah. No, leave your hooves on. I want to see them. <laughs> yeah, there's probably there's probably two goat looking people fucking. Yeah, without a doubt. Like, I don't know what it is, but getting dressed up as a goat just makes people horny. There is, it's the whips the horns. and latex, the, it's the horns. horns. It's the horns. That's what makes them horny. You see, because I I get it. It's horns because they're the it's horns. literal. The horn they're, they're literally all literal horny horns. They're literally yeah. horny. Uh, yeah, I yeah. get that's pretty good. Yeah, see, see, this is this is the direction that the podcast is going to be going uh, now that Brandon's a father. Um, even though I'm not a father, I will still be making dad jokes. So, I started following it, some dad joke pages on Instagram. I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so some of these costumes are utterly horrifying. Like, if you haven't heard of Krampus Knot, uh, check out the sources for some footage from Graz, which, um, is the Austrian version of the parade. It's pretty, pretty intense. Um, but Brandon, without further ado, we're going to talk about the thing that you and I both are decently familiar with, I believe. Yeah. And that is Zwart Pete, or Black Pete. And he's more or less a Dutch copy of Krampus with, like, a few alterations, right? He's yeah. got some of the same DNA. Um, so he originates from the Netherlands. Black Pete is a simil- is similarly a co-pilot to a version of St. Nicholas known as Sinterklaas. Interestingly, Sinterklaas can trace his origins to the Wild Hunt, which oh, I yeah. didn't realize that, but, like, he's related to Odin if you, like follow the folkloric like history of Sinterklaas. He has like there's like a there's like a lineage to Odin for Sinterklaas, which is kind of hilarious. Um which the Wild Hunt in its own right is something that I want to cover on an episode at some point. That, because it's like Yeah, that can get its own uh it, its own whole well, thing. I also think the Wild Hunt is uh, another Wheel of Time thing that we referenced uh, earlier this episode. If, uh, think book one, uh, two or three, perhaps. It's, de- it's also it's also um, the Witcher's third game has the subtext of Wild Hunt. Oh yeah, um, it, but it's it's a European wide phenomena, and like it, it's one of those things that has multiple iterations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I've tried to do an episode on it, but it's like incredibly deep, right? So I, I need to kind of, like, segment it out a little bit and, like, yeah. find good breakup points because, like, there's a lot to the Wild Hunt. Um, and, like, there's even, like, you, you, it even gets into stuff like psychopomps and things along those lines. So it's, mm-hmm. like, fucking wild. Literally. Um, <laughs> uh, but that being said... Black Pete is also a mutation of the helpers in this context. So there are helpers, there are attendants to Odin, who he is a descendant of in some capacity. Yeah. Now, 
Originally, Black Pete was just a helper. He was less of a boogeyman and more of a secretary to Santa Claus. And <laughs> yeah, helper. <laughs> I'm saying secretary, but there is a there's a subtext there that we'll get to in a second. There's some finger quotes going on. <laughs> there's some there's a lot of finger quotes in this ep- this part of the episode. Um you might be you might be able to guess you might be able to put two and two together at this point. <laughs> what's gonna happen with Black Pete? But like, there's. I'm gonna unfold this story. I'm not gonna give it away. We're not gonna give out the punchline yet, Brandon. No. Nope. Um, the horrifying, horrifying punchline. Uh. <laughs> so according to tradition, Center Klaus and Black Pete arrived on the feast of Saint Nicholas after traveling from Madrid, Spain, typically on a boat. This is literally what the story is. They come from Spain. Yeah. Um, originally, Sinterklaas would mete out rewards and punishments to children, placing him squarely in boogeyman territory. Um, however, it seems that people eventually realized uh, that having a holy saint of the Catholic Church exercising violence against children and kidnapping them is a bit troubling. I think you mean on the nose, but continue. <laughs> oh, it, it is. Don't get me wrong. It's it's probably the most saintly thing I've ever heard. Like, if you look into uh, Mother Teresa, this tracks. Uh-huh. uh-huh. This 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 is on on par for a lot of saints. Um, but they don't want to acknowledge that. No. So eventually, uh, Black Pete did take the on the form of the more sinister and violent as- aspects of Sinterklaas, who. In doing that, he disciplined children, or in some cases, took them back to Spain. And I also want to point out, he also gave children treats as well. Black Pete is a strange character. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and now, Brandon, you know why I haven't described it yet, but you, the uh-huh. audience, might be wondering, Hey, John, why haven't you described what Black Pete looks like? Um, and I'm going to reply, <laughs> he's literally just a black guy from Spain. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Now, and he's typically associated with the Islamic population. He's been described in racist terms, I might add. Keep in mind, this is not how I would describe it, as Moorish, which is a worthless, completely worthless identifier for something. It is a racist way to say a black person from Spain because it's specifically referring to the Muslim population of Spain that happens to be black from when the when Islamic nations took over a portion of Spain during the Crusades. Super duper racist and not an accurate thing to say. There might be one or two problematic aspects to um, Uh, Black Pete. (laughs) There's a lot of problematic aspects because it turns out Black Pete is basically Sinterklaas's slave. Helper. Slave. He's um everyone knows every year Senator Klaus goes to Spain and traffics helpers. He does, he does. <laughs> um but Brandon, this isn't even the worst part about Black Pete. Uh, no, could have what, what's the worst part? <laughs> now remember, this takes place in the Netherlands. The yes. Dutch people um Oh, also an important thing that, that that we should probably note is that um we're not talking about the olden times. We're talking about now. This is the now times. This is now. What I'm about to talk about, everything that I'm about to talk about is happening today. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it happened probably last week when we recorded this. Almost yeah. exactly <laughs> last week, to be honest. Yeah. Um So now people like their book even they like their Christmas boogeymen, and they really like to cosplay their Christmas boogeymen, just like Krampus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, typically, these people who do cosplay Black Pete um, are whiter than you and I, There's, or at yeah. the very least, on the same level as me, because I'm Dutch. So yeah. Oh yeah. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brandon. Black Pete, as we've said before, is literally a black man. Yeah. So, of course, they dress up as him, and they're dressing in, like, the kind of raci- racist caricature, like, uh, 
Spanish black person, like, you know, yeah. the, the, the Islamic style dress. They've got the afros. And um, one very important thing. The, the curly hair the, and full blackface. Full blackface. <laughs> full blackface. Full blackface. <laughs> Complete blackface. Now, Brandon, I yeah. want you to describe the picture in the episode copy. And I want to point out, this is a recent picture. Yeah. This yeah. picture has High been quality. taken in in the last decade. Lots of megapixels in this one. Yes. Very, yeah. I would say it looks like two um, people who you wouldn't be surprised if they were elementary school teachers by like, mm-hmm. just how they look. And uh, like, um, I would say spirit Halloween quality uh, curly haired wigs and mm-hmm, just... Mm-hmm. Just lots of probably dollar store shoe polish. Yeah, just yeah, lots bad. of it. And not, not only that, not only that, but they have red, li- bright red lipstick on. Yeah, like I cannot articulate how terrible this is. That's it's. If you weren't aware that it was a thing that happened, and you saw it as a thing on a tv show you'd be like nobody does like like, that's too much no one's gonna believe it but it happens it happens and brandon and now i'm gonna i'm gonna answer some questions that the listeners might be having um yes as we've said before people still don this costume um and oh oh yeah by the way uh, i'm dutch right and we're from kingston and kingston has the old dutch church kingston is uh it was founded by the dutch right because we're in new york we're in that part of new york um, I'm about 95% sure I saw someone wearing a Black Pete costume in my lifetime at the Old Dutch Church. That's not, not, not surprising. There's also a lot of, uh, uh, Nazi and white supremacist graffiti all over, uh, that area. Yeah. Um, there's a lot and, of, and, I would say a lo- there, there's a lot of Celtic crosses in Kingston. Yeah. Brandon, uh, Black Pete. He's strongly supported by the neo-Nazi and white supremacist communities in the Netherlands yeah. and other parts of the world, for that matter. Um, and this is the following. The following tweet was made by Tom Vandeput talking about an event in Zadam 2018. Today, anti-racist protesters peacefully calling for the abolition of Black Pete, the blackface servant of the Dutch Santa Claus, were spat on by bystanders, attacked by violent mobs, and beaten by the police officers supposedly in charge of their protection. That tracks. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. tracks. And it gets worse, Brandon. Uh, this is all from an Al Jazeera article, uh, which I recommend reading. There's also a Time article. They're both in the show notes. Read both of them because they're fucking wild and horrifying. Um this year, Zadam hosted the main center class arrival parade on November 17th, televised live by the Dutch broadcaster NTR. And now, Brandon. Yes. Once again, pointing out 2018, November 17th. Z- yeah. Z- Zandam is just north of the Netherlands. It's just north of um, Amsterdam. So, like, okay. major fucking. Major cities. Yeah, major cities. These are huge cities. These are important cities in the Netherlands that are still doing. We're still doing this parade in 2018. Even though the broadcaster said in October there would be no Zwart Pete characters in blackface, Zwart Pete's were there by the busload, a hundred and fifty in total, <laughs> escorted by dozens of police officers. No protesters were allowed near the event. And now, Brandon, it's about to get worse, because now we're going to talk about talk to someone who is in a traditional bar, a man named Jonathan, who is a hospitality entrepreneur who is watching a football match. He was reluctant to comment at first when Al Jazeera reporters tried to interview him, but he eventually said that the Black Pete debate is ridiculous. <clears throat> oh, and this before is a you continue, quote. I I haven't read ahead. Would you say this is? Or my guess is going to be whatever argument he is going to make is going to be very similar to arguments people make about, like, changing the names of football teams. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, maybe, maybe, okay, maybe. 
Uh, I also want to point out, I'm not taking joy in this because I'm happy that this thing exists. This is this is me um, dealing with the fact that I can't process that this is still a thing that people think is okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is this is an incredulity laugh, not a I think this is funny because it's happening laugh. I think that this is horrifying, and humor is the only way that I can process it. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Jonathan says, if there is one country where people don't discriminate, it's the Netherlands. Why do all Dutch traditions have to be ruined? People are free to do Shabbat, Ramadan, pray three times a day, but a Dutch person is not free to celebrate Black Pete? It's an outrage. In all honesty, I think it's a political game. It's a distraction from the things that really matter. (laughs) Black Pete is not about Black Pete says Lambrecht Wessels, a conflict analysis. He sees the growing battle over Sinterklaas' helper as a proxy for much larger issues in the country, mainly rapidly changing demographics, economic insecurity, and a lack of proper migration policy, all of which have fueled the recent rise of nationalistic policies in the Netherlands. Hey, Um, who would have guessed I was right? (laughs) Yeah. um, I also want to point out, I found a Nat Geo article that I didn't finish read. I wasn't able to finish reading. Um... But there's a quote in that, and I'm going to pull it up real quick. Uh, Pete, Black Pete. Black Nat Geo. Interesting. Oh, Um, sorry, I read ahead. Uh, Never mind. I'll I'll, I'll talk later. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So uh, there's a quote from the Prime Minister of... Uh, the Netherlands in this story. Um, where is it? Uh, bu- 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 oh no, I can't see it. Um, that basically is the equivalent of Donald Trump saying, uh, there are bad people. There are good people on both sides. Oh, g- g- good. Um, Uh, so let, let me just, let, I feel bad that I didn't grab this. Um, oh, here we go. It's on CNN. Uh, Prime Minister Mark Ruffel won't ban Black Pete. Uh, da, 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 da. uh, Zwart Pete or Black Pete have undergone ma- major changes, but he won't go as far as banning it. Uh, he said that, uh, let's see, uh, I myself has also have also experienced major changes about Black Pete. What said during a late night power mentally debate. I also belong to that group say, that said Black Pete is simply black. <laughs> um, and he also like he literally said that there's violence on both sides. The violence is the responsibility of extremists on both sides. That's the quote. Um, he said that. <laughs> yeah. Unironically. Um, so. Here's the thing. It's a problem across the world, it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> like, a major problem. Um, And, like, the other fucked up thing is, like, there's 17 million people in the Netherlands. And 700,000 of them, at least, have African descent. Or of African yeah. descent. So that's a 17th of your population, practically. Yeah. Yeah. Not good. No. Really not good. And, like, actually, I was reading up on it, and there's, like, a really serious problem in the Netherlands of discrimination um, where people where, where people of color are placed into, um, like, like, technical schools that are not for the most bright so to speak. Yeah. Um, and partially that's because like a lot of the times it's people who have just moved to the Netherlands and aren't, aren't like good at Dutch as their primary language. Yeah. Like things that, that shouldn't qualify you as needing to go to a special school. Yeah. Um, it's, it's super duper racist. And like, there's even, uh, it's one of those things. A lot of European countries are more racist than they think. Because they don't have the, the like, <laughs> level of diversity in those countries is not on the same level as, like, in the U- U.S. I'm not yeah. saying that the U.S. is good. Keep in mind. 
I don't think the U.S. is good at diversity at all. We just happen to have a fuck ton more people from a fuck ton different cultures. Yeah. So we hit the problems quicker, but like other countries still have the same fucking problems. Oh, yeah. Um, but I do want to at least shine a light of hope onto this conversation. And when I say shine, shine a light of hope, like, it's the, the dimmest light of hope ever. But, like, at least we can cling to this, I guess. Um, some efforts have been made by the black community in the Netherlands, particularly a campaign spearheaded by Jerry Efrile. Efrie? Efrie? Efrie. I don't know how to pronounce Dutch stuff. Um, the leader of Kick Out Zwart Pete campaign have been making some major waves. While nowhere near done, Black Pete has been slowly phased out of some major parades in the Netherlands, such as the Amsterdam Parade. Um, and he's been replaced by a new character called Sudi Pete, which I honestly think you should just get rid of the Pete character altogether. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I agree with you with the, the give her the character altogether. We all know what you're doing by yeah. like, providing an alternative yeah. with City Pete. Because that's why mm-hmm. earlier I was like, oh, I was like, oh yeah, they're trying to t- say he's a chimney sweep now. Yeah, but if you if you look up Sooty Pete, some people go really heavy with the the chimney ash. Yeah, they yeah, they do, really, they do. They do. They do. I would say some they, go full coverage. Yeah, I I I would say that it's like not so much a solution to the problem as a lateral move. <laughs> um, where they're just renaming it, so they're like, "See, it's not, it's not Black Pete, it's Sooty Pete." Yeah, but they're still like dealing with all the same. Um, it's still just as racist, really. Let's, let's yeah. be real. Yeah, it doesn't fix anything. It doesn't fix anything. Um, and at least forty-five parades have committed to not having the character to be in the play. Uh, forty-five Center Klaus parades. I should note, however, there are six hundred, six hundred. There's at least 600 Sinterklaas parades in the Netherlands today. Yeah. So um, that's not even a sixth. That's not even a, that's a, about a twelfth of all uh, Sinterklaas parades um, have cut him out of it. So, yeah. Um, we're talking about the Boogeyman. That was the Boogeyman, guys. The that's boogeyman. the first episode on the Boogeyman. Um, I think the real Boogeyman is... How like this is just a nightmare and like super not okay. I just really want to point that out. Like I I'm laughing, but as I said before, it's out of just sheer terror at how terrible this thing is. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's thing things be stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I figured I'd start light with our uh, first episode back from our break. So, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah we, <laughs> we went straight I, from I, the void that is the boogeyman <laughs> to, to Black Pete. Yeah. We, yeah. Oh. I mean, it, it's it's honestly not that bad of a transition because it it tracks. Yeah, it tracks. My next one is um, uh, I'm going to try to do a, 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 a holiday one as well. And... Uh, mm-hmm. I don't. I'm not done yet, but so far, uh, there's just bad. You're welcome. Bad. Um, yeah, thank you, thank a, accordion you. playing, I think, is the worst thing. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, that might be a war crime because, like, I like Weird Al, so like, bad accordion Actually, playing. There's. Oh, I can't wait for you to see this video of them playing a song. There's an instrument that I could only describe as a fart stick. That's the real crime in that episode. Oh no, a fart stick. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Well, um, I guess let's get to the pluggables. Uh, first and foremost, um, our website is critbdcast dot com. Our Instagram is at critbdcast. I'm actually posting stuff to that now. Um, to uh, well, our website, our 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 Instagram. I don't post. Shit oh to yes, the our Instagram. Web- yeah. Yeah, the website's just a landing page that has links. I recently updated it to remove the Google Play music one because it turns out uh google play pop music is gone and so is their podcast server oh damn all right their podcast rss feed is gone i didn't realize that so it was redirecting to a dead link for a while okay um but we're we're back in business i think i think i replaced it with oh wait no i still have google play on there i thought i fixed that 
Whoops. Let's I see. gotta fix that. So, anywho, um, I was gonna make it Spotify, but I got lazy. Uh, we also have a Twitter at CartopediaCast. Our sound, well, we don't use a SoundCloud. Forgot about that. Um, <laughs> I gotta really remove that. I am updating some copy. of my sheets live right now. Um, our email is CartopediaCast at gmail dot com or us at CartopediaCast dot com. Um, if you have any suggestions, be sure to provide them. As this episode was in fact a suggestion. Um, I also got a suggestion from someone on Instagram, which I'm working on it, but it's probably going to have to be a part of a bigger episode because there's just not a lot of meat on it because it's a um, it's a regional cryptid. It's a regional like legend from Mexico, so the amount of sources oh. in English are a little bit limited. Yeah, we could potentially do like um, I've done it before, like a, an episode where there's it's just like four or five one where there there's not a lot of meat or english language sources where we just yeah pack them all together well, we, yeah that's what we tend to do uh particularly we do that a lot with the um spanish speaking country stuff um cuz like here's the thing there's so many weebs that you can get basically anything in japanese <laughs> like it's so easy to find out stuff about japanese cryptids cuz like there's just a lot of weebs yeah Oh, I'm so glad there's so many weebs. John. Yeah. You have an anime profile picture. So my my Discord profile picture is actually pretty funny. I like that profile picture. <laughs> it's um It's from Sukumichi, which is uh uh an isekai, and it's a picture of a I think she's a Like either like a dark elf type character, oh. I forget what they call it in that series. But um, she's a dark elf and she's eating banana, See, um, and she's trying to kill herself with bananas, but she enjoys the taste. Oh, See, so you won me over with uh, isekai. I just I, I, oh, I, love, I isekai. love isekai. There's a there, there's an isekai that's basically John Wick the isekai. What? The world's finest assassin is reincarnated in another world as an aristocrat. That is on Country Roll right now, and it's basically if John Wick was resurrected into another world. Oh, okay. And he fucks. <laughs> oh, I believe he does. He does. He fucks. He fucks prostitutes in it. Not on screen, <laughs> but he definitely fucks prostitutes. That's a that's a thing. That is a thing that happens if it's in that on show screen, for sure. It's, it transitions from Crunchy Roll to some other websites. It, it it's not it, it's it's not all the all the good bits are censored out but like you know it's it's there's impl- the implications there the implication okay the implication um so uh and thank you to our jackalopes who are responsible for this episode in particular um and Brandon can you go through our list for right now sure thing we've got Clay Sinclair Marty Von Party Bird Schneider Jonathan Ep- Shepard I don't know I said Eppard. Jonathan Shepard, Matthew Smith, and the new Bushcraft Kelso. Who is responsible for this episode, so thank you. Yeah. Um, and the only reason I did... Th- so I did this episode because it's not the Wendigo or anything. <laughs> if, 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 if the cryptid is a representation of white people, literally, I don't touch them anymore. Because um, problematic shit. For two lily white people, two lily, lily white men talking about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have a Facebook group, but I don't post to it because Facebook is more or less responsible for the decline of American civilization, uh, for Western civilization. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, rate and review or subscribe. I realize that there's a lot of platforms that don't allow you to rate, review, or I subscribe. I think it might now. be limited to iTunes at this point. Spotify yeah, doesn't allow it. It's um, really weird. You can follow on Spotify. Don't F- follow yeah. on Spotify. That that helps. Yeah, because that'll that'll maybe hopefully put us into trending. Did you remember the time that we were like at the top of the the charts for like, um, Peru? Yeah, like we were we were the top of the comedy charts for Peru once, which is yeah. fucking hilarious. So, um, hello again to all our Peruvian friends. I think we have one Peruvian listener. Yes. They did it. That person did it. Thank you. Yo, well, you um, know what I think it was? I think it was a um, uh, a probably uh, found us and then just did a big download. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, 
Yeah, and once again, any monster requests or stories, be sure to send them in. We're getting a little bit less cryptidy, I find now, um, but that's mainly because like a lot of the easy pick in cryptids we've covered. So we're going, we're di- we're dipping into folklore a little bit more than we used to. Um, yeah, or, or we're working on multiple episodes. Like there's the cryptidy yeah. one that I've got on this monitor, and then the other one that's easier to get through on that one, and and then we're slowly mm-hmm. building up these guys. These other ones, they're still yeah. coming, but they take a little yeah. bit more work. And I promise there is an episode in which I make a lot of Dwayne the Rock Johnson jokes. It's coming. Oh, nice. Eventually. So that's a that's a spoiler to an episode I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at cryptobrandon. On Instagram, I'm Mew2057. On Twitter, I'm at JF Dunham. My website is johndunhamgames.com, which seems, which is actually hosted on the Cryptopedia website uh, because I don't feel like paying for two servers. Um, and my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com, and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. And I just really want to thank Tom again. He's He's fucking awesome uh he does some really cool shit if you follow definitely follow on instagram he's done some really impressive like like artwork for a lot of really impressive things he does and it's i like seeing his um his merch in the wild like i'll be watching stuff on youtube and then on the bottom where they show like uh like shirts and shirts and merch and stuff i'll see something be like looks like tom and i'll go to his page and be like that is tom awesome yeah. yeah no it's always fun to see keep at it man we love you um as always i'm john i'm brandon and things are gonna get weird and talking about weird john um yeah. have you found that uh the humbler is too limiting um it limits your movement too much because yeah, of, its, just a, of its manufacture. Just, just a bit too much. It's got too much wood. Yeah. Or maybe so, not enough. I'm not sure. It's it's either too much or too little. It's I've got the good two. news for you. They improved mm. it to the... There's an... Oh! oh. <laughs> less limiting. Oh, okay. Hell's okay. Hell's Tether so it's... Bell Pole Stretcher. It's oh, the sequel to The Humbler. It doesn't okay, limit okay. your movement. Interesting, interesting. I mean, it does, but oh boy, I just clicked on the image. <laughs> you probably shouldn't have done that. I should not have done that. I should not have done that. That man looks like he's enjoying himself, though. So you know what? Good for him. That oh, there's a. Him. Oh yeah, he looks like he's having fun. Yeah, he looks like he's enjoying himself. Yeah, and he can move. He can crawl around, possibly now. Mm-hmm. That's a lots of options. Yeah, so many options. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's in your Man, history it, now. If Good we luck ever with your get cookies, a, you know for a fact that if we ever got a PO box, we'd be sent to Humbler. <laughs> I didn't know it. Yep, like zero chance. Like, like if we ever reach a point where we we need to set up a PO box for whatever reason, a Humbler will show up there. There's zero doubt in my mind. It will be the first thing that shows up. So, that, and that's it. It will just be Humblers. It will literally just be that. And honestly. I'll I'll make a market of selling humblers secondhand, as you should. <laughs> the uh, right. great review on that one I found on Twitter, by the way, so, so it just showed up in my Twitter feed one day, and I was like, oh, I'll tell John because he's the only person who appreciate that. Um, uh, Danica said that I've always wanted a humbler, but didn't like the idea of being limited to just my hands and knees. Now I can wear uh, one, but with greater mobility. Uh, they go on talking about stuff that they do with it (laughs) seems good seems good people are thrilled about the mobility nice yeah i was i was always hoping that they would uh they would improve on that design 